Okay, let's get into it. Uh, chapter 9. So we're looking at chapter 9. Programming techniques. So today I'm just going to tell you more about programming techniques. Not We're not going to go into it too much. Um, and right at the end there's a section on um, acceleration. That I, I'm just going to use the example to explain it to you but i'm not going to expect you guys to actually do a calculation for um for acceleration uh, i'll maybe have a small informal test to do just to test the basics of uh of it but i'm not going to ask you extensive um extension of time and calculating your um cost uh if if you need to accelerate but it's very important to realize that you can actually ask the client if you ask for acceleration to actually ask more money for it because obviously you have to put in more resources and so on okay so chapter nine in the introduction there are many types of programming techniques it comes down to personal preference like i said that other guy that did that uh, that large building in dubai by hand um he still did a uh, bar chart a link bar chart but it was all done by hand so um, yeah it's it basically comes down to preference so we're going to look at um, possible um, ways of scheduling that you might be exposed to uh, bar charts and then we're going to have link bar charts so the difference between a bar chart and a link bar chart is basically an excel chart against a, a microsoft project one we have items actually linked to each other and then you've got arrow diagrams which you pr probably did in pkm uh, free uh, last year um, you will I'll, I'll jot your memory now um, and then uh, precedence diagrams and then we're just quickly going to touch on line and by, uh, balance diagrams and time change uh, diagrams but this is a link bar chart uh, that we've got um, so all that a link bar chart says is that the one item is linked to the other ones but you may have different uh, relationships between your links you may have an item which has a finish to start so once the one is finished it's linked to the other one uh, so when that one finishes this one starts then you have your start finish um, start to start uh, when this one starts the other one will start so I don't know there's not if you want if this one starts this one may start as well and then usually you may have a delay built into that once this one starts two days after that one this one can start that's the type of arrangement then you've got finish to finish basically this item when that one finishes this one has to be finished as well okay then you have a start to finish uh, whenever this one um, finishes uh, I'm just looking for that arrangement here I can't find it now uh, start to finish as soon as this one starts that one has to be finished Uh, there's no one that's linked like that but basically what it will um, be i'm just going to make this one green uh, let's make it orange uh, for instance this one can't start if that activity is not finished understand so that's that type of thing um, and then the extra one which is not in the book is a hammock if you do get involved or see hammock uh, please note that's just the item which is linked as soon as this one starts it's it that item starts and it runs all the way up to maybe when that one finishes uh, for instance your quality management might be an item like that it starts from the start and it finishes at the end so that's a hammock um, type of arrangement so this is arrangements you only really start learning that as soon as you're applying or uh, starting to schedule um, but please know the difference um, Cook actually when goes through that and actually shows it very nicely for us. Um, you've, here's the different steps when you're doing your um, scheduling. You list your items 
I think we spoke about that the previous time. Then you add your time and then you link them to each other. And then you link bar charts, the principles we, we spoke about finish to start, start to start, overlapping relationships. This is where you have a bit of a delay. And then you have finish to finish relationships as well. Okay, the advantages of bar charts, obviously this is important, uh, simple and easy to understand, applicable to all uh, stages of planning, it's easy to link pre-tender pre contracts with, uh, with the master program, it mimics construction sequence, easily updated, milestones and symbols can be shown, resource allocation um, can be illustrated, uh, facilitates the production of labor histograms, value, um, value time forecast, cumulative labor, plant forecast, or other budget related items. Contractual requirements, like I said in the previous lecture, um, chapter, um, it might be a prerequisite from your um, contract. It's re readily uh, updated with key deliverables and information. It's nice to have a, a, a or easy to keep a as built program once you've got a, a, a standard program. And it has fi financial forecasts can be done from it. It's presentable to your client. And yeah, that's more or less it. The advantages or disadvantages of bar charts it can be dependencies cannot be shown readily. Um, it's just you can't show all the detail on your bar chart. The links can become confusing and thus complex interrelationships cannot be shown clearly. So my rule of thumb usually when I do schedules is don't overcomplicate it. Um, rather when um, or when you do add a lot of details make sure that you actually can scroll down or hide the necessary information uh, or rather make a new chart to if you want to go into detail of when certain items need to be done. Okay, then developing a, a linked bar chart, that's a process that we've looked at, set the time periods and link to various tasks, insert summary task and add durations, link to relevant activities. So that's what we looked at. Okay, then we get to network an analysis. Uh, we've got the critical path method and the PERT analysis, uh, programming evaluation and review technique. So in COMR, you guys look at the PERT um, techniques quite, uh, quite thoroughly. Uh, so please just note that. And earned value is also very important that you did in PQM3 last year. PQM. PQ, PQ, PQM. <clears throat> with Risa. Mm. Okay, and you might recognize this. Okay, cool. And you guys know what the um, critical path is? It's the longest, shortest path. Yeah, cool. Okay, so it's always easiest to work from the back, going or from the end, start at the end and work your way back to actually get to your critical path. So you look for your um, longest path which is 4 and then you get to G and you've got 3 and then this one is quite easy I hope I'm correct now calculate your critical path which is A, D, G, J so that's the longest path to actually get the project done and then your procedure diagrams do you guys remember this? Okay, we're not going to do much on this uh, because um, I presume that you've done this very thoroughly. You did your forward pass, you did your backward pass, and you could actually calculate your critical path um, based on that. Okay, then um, Cook and Williams just goes on and he explains your finish your start relationship and your link bar chart relationships. So this is just basically what we already looked at. Uh, just explain better. So you guys will have to be able to explain to me what is your start-to-start -start relationship. How does that work? 
Okay, start to start uh, relationships, finish to finish relationships, start to finish relationships. Okay, then line of balance is your elemental trend analysis. Now, this represents a uh, representation of the re uh, repetitive operations. Uh, it is a visual display of the rate of working difference activities on a program. It is, and it's used to focus on sequenced items to find the optimum plant ratio of labor, plant, etc. Okay. Now, this is something which I'm not going to test you guys on. But I want you guys to at least know how that looks. Um, the line of balance diagrams looks as follows. So you must be able to actually name that at least. Um, so what it does is in principle it just lists the items which has a certain sequence uh, in, in motion so for instance you've got activity A, B and C and then activity A proceeding at a faster rate than, um, is uh, than activity B activity C proceeding at a slower rate than B so then you can see but there's a buffer there so in what we can do is we can add more resources to B and actually close that gap to have a uniform um, <coughs> buffer between all the items so that's basically what it's used for but uh, I'm not going to test you guys on how that's actually used it's fairly rarely used I, th I think it's only the real um, big uh, construction companies that might use this because if you do your project planning in your um, in Microsoft projects properly or CCS properly you can actually do this automatically so it's not a thing that you need to actually draw up that guy that did everything by hand he might have used this method to actually just calculate so it's this. Just yeah just a line of ja, je moet ja, je moet het kan noemen. Ja, als je het vele wijs maakt, kan je daar nog vele iets wijs. Je zou zo one mark, maybe two, at most, ja, if any. So, oké, dan we get to time change diagrams, is also known as the location chart. It's limited to certain projects advantages in showing the order of activities uh, or operations where activities are happening locationally um, how activities must progress in relation to direction and distance time key dates and holidays basically what it is is it's a program on your drawing it's usually something that works very well if you're doing a road uh, because you have to progress a certain section from this side your workflow is from this side of the site to that side of the site so the um, construction starts in one point and proceeds in an orderly fashion towards another location and just think if you need to represent a building on something like that you can't really do that uh, the 4, 4d BIM video that we looked at earlier might explain that a little bit more it's just a visual way of actually um, looking or representing the program so here's the example, basically you have your time in weeks here on the left and you have your activities and your site on this side and as you progress from the site from the top down um, the items activity 1 is started, activity 2, activity 3, activity 4 etc. You have a holiday period in there, activity 5. No. Also, just be able to, um, to identify it if I do show it to you. Okay. And also, at least know that it's a visual way of actually showing um, the program. Okay. The main thing about these uh, programs that I'm showing you is to, to know what it is. If someone talks into a site meeting, or walks into a site meeting and, and says he he's done a time change diagram for us. Don't look like a idiot there and 
not know what it is. That's the main purpose of it, is just to educate you guys on what it is. But whenever a client asks you, um, okay, I want to do a bar chart or a time change diagram for this project, and you said, no, you can't, uh, I would rather do a bar chart because of this. Yes. Okay, then we get to accelerating the project. The contracts, okay, there might be multiple reasons why you need to accelerate. The contractor's reasons may be less in liquid, uh, you, uh, liquid damages. Um, if you're behind, then you need to pay a whole lot of accounts. Client reasons is op opening sooner to get the benefit of winter sales, for instance. Okay, then you have the concept of normal time and normal costs. So this is important. And you have a crash time crash cost okay this is now your required time then you have your cost slope the critical path compressed as densely as possible okay then um, we've got a few definitions of in, uh, your increase in cost reduction in time uh, or your uh, crash cost um, normal cost over your normal time less your cash time gives you your cost slope okay so your crash time is that time that that the client actually um, wants so your crash time is he wants to reduce it in this case by four days so that's your crash time normal time less your crash time Okay, and then I just went further to actually um, do a bit of a diagram, but this is what's in your books. And this is more or less the type of uh, question what I'll ask you is to calculate the crash time for me uh, on, a, on a project or calculate the uh, crash cost. Your cost slope, sorry. Okay, so your cost slope might be something that I'll ask. Yeah, give you all this by info. Or what I'll do is at the hand of this information explain to me what the cost slope is and for what it is used for. Okay. Okay, then you have direct cost that just go into it at, um a bit more in detail you have your direct cost which is your labor eg bonuses payments more labor you have your plant increase of plant materials more waste subcontractors direct and indirect factors for them as well and then we've got overheads uh, your admin um, so each of these items might increase when you have direct costs okay your indirect costs is normally in your p's and g's is your project supervision Site hutting and accommodation, site office, telephones, heating, lighting, buckies, and site transport, etc. So, obviously, as your direct cost, uh, if you need to accelerate, your direct cost will increase. Your indirect cost will decrease. They won't necessarily decrease and increase in the same ratio. Yeah. So, and that's what we're going to look at now. Um, total project cost is the direct and indirect cost um, combined. The optimum project duration uh, is where the most beneficial least cost situation occurs and taking into account both the direct and indirect costs. Okay, so you have your direct cost and your indirect cost here. So this is what I was talking about. You have your, as your time is reduced, your direct cost will be increased. As your time is reduced, your indirect cost will decrease. Okay? You guys with me on that? But now finding the optimum decrease uh, or item here is what you do is you add that one to that one or, or the difference to get that increase of cost. So you have a negative one there, your difference between that one and that one added to your difference to that one. 
is the inc is that increase that brings you to that one okay so your optimum time is usually the best way that I can explain that is where you have an exponential growth well I'll explain that to you now in the next example um, but that's basically up to this point how far they explain it okay within the book so I couldn't understand it uh, really uh, when I first looked at it only up to this this point but if we go further to our example which is on page starts here on page 80, uh, 189 at the bottom um, and basically it says is we've got this project here's the initial uh, Arab diagram that we've got we've got activities a up to i we've got the normal time and then we've got the normal costs and then we've got crash time on this side to that time and then we've got the uh, crash uh, the crash time sorry on this from a to i and then we've got the uh, crash cost which is given to us okay so that's given and the flow diagram is given to us now what happens is we need to calculate the normal time and normal uh, cost variances so this is now the diagram just updated so what we do is we calculate the um, the critical path so um, working from this side going backwards uh, we can see okay obviously there's no other preceder to this but we've got um, normal time is six days so we we get to this point and then we look for the longest one which is f 10 and then from here on in it's e and then a okay so that's our critical path okay so underneath our normal time which is 28 weeks our normal cost will be 198 uh, pounds plus our indirect cost is 28 times at 2,000 pounds per, um, per day to get a total normal cost of 254 okay so up to this point that's fairly straightforward okay no change or changes to that the next step or the first method of actually calculating it is uh, they do a reduction in the project time so on that is now everything up to page 190 the two scenarios will now be the, be considered so uh, what they say is a re reduction of five weeks in a project duration in order to complete the project by week 23 so the client asked for a five week um, reduction in time the effect on the direct and indirect costs will be considered in order to achieve the reduction in time okay then we go to 192 in order to reduce the project duration by five weeks it will be necessary to consider the cost slope of all activities okay the uh, assessment of the cost slopes and the appropriate rankings are indicated in uh, 9.42 so okay this is what they did they uh, went and calculated each crash time um, and crash slope for each item so uh, for item a e f and d we have the crash times here costs or saving in time is two days two four days okay, then we've got the normal time which is calculated here and then we've got the cost cost slope which is indicated here okay and they need a saving of five days so five days or five weeks five weeks sorry so five weeks so you basically take the items which has the lowest uh, or you rank the items which has the lowest cost implication and those are the items that you need to reduce so for instance that's why if you go through the example f won't be included because it has the highest cost slope so it's not a good thing to actually tamper with that period of items so what they identified is okay 
items A, E, and D will have the will be the items which has the least effect on um, on the uh, duration or the cost if you if we reduce that. Okay. Okay. Something which I didn't mention is we're only looking at the items on the critical path. That's why I looked at at that section. Okay. So um, you can see here non-critical operations. Uh, looked at. Okay, so then getting to the revised diagram on six. So the second scenario that you can actually look at is to actually um, rank your items. Uh, as you as we saw is your item six is ranked first item a is ranked second third is your item e and okay if doesn't fall within that because we only want to uh, look at five weeks saving and not more than that Okay, so analysis is based on the acceleration project period for 23 weeks. Okay, and now they do uh, another a little um, calculation. So the uh, number of weeks, they start with the highest, your normal number. So you have your direct costs, and your indirect costs. This is the method that I like more, most because it's you can actually see it. But what they just do is they add to... Um, your ex direct cost as you go down and you reduce your uh, your time uh, you can see what the effect will, will be immediately so you can see where the optimum uh, cost saving would be so uh, you can see your direct cost is free and then your indirect cost is minus two so you have an aggregate cost added uh, if you reduce it with one week uh, of one um, a thousand pounds basically that's the difference between your direct cost which you add and your indirect cost that you actually subtract okay so there's one added there's one added there and then there's one added here or two you can see your items here is now your direct cost each time you add four thousand pounds and you subtract uh, to a uh, thousand pounds so you just add two there and two there and the, so you could go on for each activity so now the question is where's your optimum amount of time that you can actually uh, reduce your project with and it's where it climbs exponentially from the one to the other okay so it, at, in this instance it's between um, well at the end of 24 weeks okay where the difference actually is okay so if you go to your diagram optimum time least cost is 24 weeks um, which is there because that's where your optimum or exponential growth is okay so that's basically in a nutshell I'm not gonna ask this to you guys but I just went through it to actually to try and explain to you guys what you need to consider uh, when we're talking about um, accelerating the project and trying to calculate um, the optimum time for an actually reducing your project so it's not something that that we're going to test you guys on but I want you guys at least to know what whenever you get into a work situation uh, to actually use it because in, in the real reality of uh, a work situation uh, you're actually gonna um, do this calculation differently you're gonna look at because how are you gonna explain this to your client uh, you're gonna have to explain to uh, to him this is um, my overheads um, and according to the contract and uh, this is how much it should be increased so there's a whole different mindset of actually uh, increasing your uh, your costs. Okay. Do you have any questions? Okay. You guys understand that this is a bit of a difficult one to go to understand, but I'll 
what I can ask on this is to explain to me how uh, you would go about in actually uh, calculating your um, your cost increase or explaining it to your client. Okay. My direct costs will increase, my indirect costs will decrease. Okay. Thank you guys.